Welcome back, everyone, to the Jake Take. Uh, I'm your host, Theo, who does not exist, Coyer. Back with Mr. Ben, because as of this recording, he's been outed of the t- of the competition. Goliath. I mean, I think it happened him. a little before this recording, but you know. <laughs> no one knows when the recording is going to happen or come out. It's all behind the scenes magic. But yeah. Uh, and not only that, he was revealed like. While we or just before we were talking last week or something, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was it was very ironic during the interview. Um, but yeah, the character is uh, just to get into. All right, I actually forgot what Goliath looked like, so I have to like go back and call up his actual. Uh, oh, which week was it? Do we want to talk about this card as a card, uh, and then separately talk about it in comparison to? My car, how do you how do you want to do the flow of this? Because I have strong opinions along several different vectors with regard to this car. <laughs> um, I think we should I think we should talk about it first, what we like, what we dislike, and then sort of compare it to the card that you created. Sure. Okay. Because that way, people who don't know about the card yet, which would be surprising to anyone watching this or listening to it. Uh, would at least get a reminder. I'll probably have them sure. up on the screen too, but yeah. So, okay. So, he's a 4 cost 4-4 four, four with 2 health. Yeah. Uh, and that by itself is not like amazing, but it's not unplayable. 4-4-2 four, four, on 4 is pretty decent. Yeah, uh, usually when they have a lower stat line like 4-4, four, four, their power is a little bit better, because on 4 we're used to seeing... Somewhere between 5 and 6, I want to say for the stat line. 7 on the high end. maybe. Yeah, I mean, that's end. pretty high on 4. <laughs> I mean, 6 is high on 3, and it's still, like, maybe not premier, but it's on the higher end of acceptable on a 4, for sure. Yeah, so... I mean, do you put a four four two into your constructed deck if it doesn't do anything else? Probably not. Yeah. Exactly. But in a draft environment or a sealed environment where maybe your other four drop choices are worse statted with powers that maybe aren't synergistic with the rest of your deck, as far as stats on this guy, he, he's acceptable. They're not bad, but they're not a reason to run the card. Yeah, to me, he he just seems very bland and generic. Like, I don't know, but I mean, looking at even looking at his power, which we haven't actually gone into yet, but I don't know. I just eh. I think I they did a pr- pretty good job of capturing Goliath, the character. He's a dude who gets bigger. Yeah, and that and that's about all the character has going on. Now I can't even hardly believe I'm gonna have this kind of criticism for super awesome games. But where I think they failed this guy is while they got the character right, they did not get the character's significance to the Civil War storyline right. Like they didn't even really touch on it, other than sort of in the card art. Yeah. Which my yeah. kid looked at this and he goes, "Can you tell me about Goliath?" And yeah, he's like a dude who gets big. He's like, well, why does he have the two extra arms? I'm like, what do you mean two extra arms? Whitman looked at this and the way Thor kind of blends in with Goliath, he thought Goliath had two like tummy arms coming out of his body. <laughs> and one of them was holding the hammer. He, he might not like that I shared that story. <laughs> you know, you can't unsee it once it gets pointed out, though. Like, yeah, the way it, the it shadowing... Is, it is there. <laughs> it's kind of funny. And Actually, when you said the two extra arms, I looked at it again and went, oh yeah, Thor's arms do kind of look like that. <laughs> yeah, w- once Wit pointed it out to me, I saw it, but I did not initially notice it. I also kind of have a negative feeling about the storm cloud along the top of that card. There's so much card art space that is just kind of squandered on a black smudge and i get upper deck doesn't have control over the card art that marvel says they're allowed to use so maybe this is the best they could do with what they were given but that just seems like 
like wasted space, like a really old magic card before they figured out how to do art the right way. You know what I mean? Like an Ice Age or like Fallen Empires era magic card where it's just got kind of an oddness to how it's framed. I think the biggest problem with the art is Goliath, unless you're choosing an older art not from um, Civil War. He didn't spend a lot of time in Civil War. Like, those might be literally the only two, you know, frames. Well, but <laughs> the, the time he spent, though, was really impactful. Like, yeah. It was a, a turning point moment in the story. So I'm glad that we saw a Goliath, although, again shockingly maybe for the first time ever i'm saying to super awesome games hey there's not enough flavor in this card <laughs> which is and just a wild critique I, as, I, as far as a character he's definitely playable is he specifically what i wanted the, the kind well obviously not i've been you know picking apart the places where i feel like he falls short from the type of character i wanted yeah i i think that's where i said when he was kind of bland I think I was talking about his flavor doesn't seem quite there. He just seems like another, oh, I get bigger, so let's just put counters on him. And, well, in this effect, you, so paying and green to get four plus one counters on a character is an effect that I've built. It, the first versus deck that I ever made that was at all competitively viable was based on that effect only i got to do it once for the entire game because it was on the sister grim supporting character over the years we have seen more and more and more and might makes right is probably the most ubiquitous example in terms of play rate of this pay a green stack counters on a dude so it's not only it's not that this effect is not good flavor for him it's that this effect is kind of getting to be tired like it's low hanging fruit like super awesome games knows paying one for four plus one counters is a good deal players take that deal it's a play mechanic that incentivizes on the board type play which is a thing players enjoy so there, there's a lot of reasons why the mechanic itself is fine but we've seen it a bunch and i, I just look at all the blank space on this card there yeah. could have been you i mean he was he was a genius right you could have put genius on this card I mean, honestly, you could have put Grab on it because he's giant. Grab would have been great. <laughs> uh, I think some kind of an effect that triggered off him being KO'd. Maybe that's too complicated for the Civil War box because yeah. we don't have... How many effects do we have in the game that trigger off a character being KO'd? Not very many. Yeah, I... I mean... Mirage? Uh, uh, what's her... What's Mantis? Yeah, Mantis. Uh, I I feel like there's a few others, but it's it's not a whole lot. So maybe the calculation is, or or maybe just my entire desire to see this character done in a certain way didn't line up with what Danny and Ben you know had planned for the set, and that's fine too. But maybe in their calculation, death rattle effects are considered kind of advanced territory because they've been very sparing in how they've used them so perhaps that type of effect wasn't sufficiently new player friendly enough to be featured in this box that that could have been part of the calculation too and as far as a card that appeals to new players this is terrific this is, is a perfect card to put in front of somebody who doesn't know what they're wait on turn four i can have an eight eight oh that seems really good yeah dude it is really good yeah it goes up curve <laughs> to like six <laughs> and if you he sticks around for a turn he can be a 12 12 like essentially this guy could be your entire mid to late game curve if you can string together enough greens and your opponent doesn't have answers for counters yeah like his his upside is pretty huge well that's because he gets bigger yeah <laughs> okay okay all <laughs> all criticisms of the flavor retracted you got me theo <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, he is a solid four drop. Like all all things aside, he's comes in if you have the green. He's someone you have to deal with because you don't want him to keep getting those on there. Like you said, you don't want him to become a twelve twelve on the next turn or a sixteen sixteen on the next turn. Yeah, he could just really get out of hand. And even as a four four. He punches down very effectively. He can clear out most playable one through three drops without 
a problem. He can trade with a lot of, of four drops, and many main characters are not leveled on turn four. I, obviously, most of us want to play main characters that level earlier than turn four, but in a tournament setting, you don't always get what you want when you're playing. So he can stun a lot of main characters. So four attack on four like these are numbers that matter so i don't want to make it seem like i hate this card or anything because i don't i think this is a playable card in certain environments the idea of chaining together a whole bunch of greens i think is more of like a draft fantasy than a constructed fantasy i think i think if there is a meta where this guy is going to be played and constructed people are going to pack things like black cat calypso even the odds they're going to pack answers for counters but, but in, a, in a world where you don't have that, could you imagine yeah. playing like um, that, uh, what's his name, the Inhuman that lets you reduce the cost of Flint. a... Flint. No, wait. No, the guy that lets you reduce the cost of a superpower. Can oh, Swain. Something? Swain. Play Swain and then play Might Makes Right on him. For So yeah. technically for green, you just got like eight counters. And a oh, card. Well, wait, two cards. Swain doesn't, you have to... Swain doesn't help... You. Oh, that's right. Might makes right is a... Never mind. Scratch what I was going to say. It was idiotic. Well, if you are if you have one green, a Swain, and an MMR, you can pull off the combo you're talking about. Yeah. You just have to sequence it with Swain targeting Goliath and the main character paying the green for the MMR. Yeah. I... And in that case, you'd have a 12-12-4 drop, which is pretty good. Although, I guess you couldn't play Swain and Goliath on the same turn. But still, the the idea of him being 12-12, 16-16 is not that crazy. And with all the ramp you have, and even if you don't have it on turn 4, he's most likely going to be there on turn 5, because he's got 2 life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so even if you play him on turn 4, and he maybe punches down and then gets stunned, on your next turn, you can go off and grow him by plus 8, without going that far out of your way. Although I would say in a deck that wants to pour greens into this superpower, do you also run MMRs in that deck? I mean, maybe it, I it's potentially it could work. Like if your main character is a different team and you can use your main character's wild to pay for the MMR and then the anti-registration wild to pay for Goliath. And then you have four in the middle that they can kind of fight over. That seems like a reasonable that uh, you're not eating there aren't too many characters eating off the same plate in that if you have a anti-registration main character and goliath in your deck i'm not sure you're gonna want to run the mmrs necessarily i don't know it's it, i have a really hard time speculating about cards in terms of theory crafting i need to get them in my hand i need to turn them sideways on my play mat before i can really put my marker down and say this is what i think of this card i know there's some other people who are much better at s kind of doing the mental experiment of slotting cards into decks I, I every time i do it i feel like i sound foolish afterwards when i get the cards and play and go oh man that was that was not worth talking about for 30 minutes on a podcast <laughs> <laughs> yeah full disclosure any theory i come up with i just consider jank i mean i would love to make goliath 12 12 but that's not something you want to base an entire deck around if you're going to a tournament. <laughs> I mean, Megan would be really good with this guy too. Oh, but then again, yeah. that's another character that's eating greens. But imagine, so you, so on turn four, you play Goliath, right? And then on turn five, you play Megan and then chain together two Swains, one targeting Goliath and then one targeting Megan. And you essentially, and, and if both... And if the second Swain that comes down, you go ahead and tear Genesis, that's three more counters. So you could end up with, you know, seven counters on Megan, four counters on Goliath. And that's a pretty strong turn five play, even though you're not playing a five drop. So there, yeah. it, that's also what does your hand composition look like that you can pour all these resources out onto the board on turn five? Wait, wait, you know, what make your MC now singularity. <laughs> <laughs> That is a favorite of mine, not because she's good, but because she's such a difficult puzzle to try to solve. Oh my gosh, yeah. I, uh... He does kind of fit into that deck, although, do you run Goliath instead of Flint in the Singularity deck? 
Uh... The Singularity deck I built, I didn't go anywhere above four, because I just assumed I'd have enough counters to be able to punch anything in the face. Yeah. <laughs> I think I so... I had uh, Lockjaw and Flint as my two four drops, and the problem I ran into often was that I would run out of card draw. So even though Lockjaw would let me play extra characters, I didn't have the extra characters in my hand necessarily to draw, which was a little bit of a struggle with that deck. Yeah, I think I put Lockjaw on mine too, and I found the same thing. I feel like some characters in theory are super good, but when you actually get them to a table, they're... Mm. <laughs> you know, the new Ultron might solve that problem. Uh, also the new Sentinels. Yeah. And yeah, that... uh, Might Makes Right. Like, all these... Okay, so we're talking about a completely different topic. Yeah, we're getting far <laughs> afield from poor old Bill Foster here. Uh, but yeah, so uh, on our podcast, or on our last interview, we actually went and made a card, because I've done that with everyone so far. Mm -hmm. um, how, does, how do you... How do we compare the two? Like, what do you think they did better, or to the thick of it? Uh, I don't think the two cards compare, really. There's two... So I came at the card design that I wanted to from the angle of the story I wanted to tell. I, I wanted to represent this character in the sense of the role he played in Civil War. And I think Danny and Ben came at this from the angle of what's the best way to represent this character. So we were really trying to answer two different questions. So it, clearly, obviously, I think my answer and my question is better than the question they chose to ask and the answer they chose to create with their card. But perhaps I'm biased in that. I don't know. I like particularly the card art that we landed on, yeah. which was card art that was featured in old verses. So at one point or another, Upper Deck printed this art on a card. Uh, I'm a little sad it didn't make a return for new verses, but I mean, I, again, I know that's not necessarily an upper deck decision. I, I liked the idea of, I, I will say the way I designed the card, it does not represent Goliath as a character nearly as well as theirs does. Like he's a little guy, his stats are kind of small, but that wasn't, that wasn't my intent going in to try to like make the best Goliath. I was trying to make the best Goliath's impact on the civil war story card. So we kind of had different purposes. So comparing the two of them is a little bit difficult because they're, they're so fundamentally different what they're trying to do. I think, I don't know. What do you think of that analysis? Uh, no, I think that's really accurate. Kind of saying that they were both answering different questions. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that we did get a few things, right? We got the character name right, and the team <laughs> affiliation. Uh, we did get their defense accurate. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we technically decided that he should have two life, but gave him one just to better represent the card. So and I think my get that right. <laughs> if I remember right, I think my first draft of him was a three cost three three. So along the line, yeah of designing him we we brushed awfully close uh to the rarefied uh, genius air that danny and ben breathe although i'm afraid we fell short yeah i mean i still really i think if this wasn't a set based around attracting new players and sort of being more simplistic i think we might have they might have gone more of a route that you see with your goliath um, there's there's kind of a really interesting question there that I think is is worth pondering, although I don't know that I necessarily have an answer. But do you think that Civil War as a storyline being used as a net to capture new players is better, the same, worse than using this big storyline to make the coolest possible cards like stuff that would service it's kind of like the fantastic battles like that box came out and we thought it was going to be a net for new players and really it was more about giving old players all kinds of crazy new toys i'm not 
sure how I feel necessarily. I love Civil War so much, so I, I want the cards to do like crazy wild things because I enjoy crazy wild things. But it's such a good net because it's such a popular story. I've kind of gone back and forth with is this the right way to use Civil War or is this maybe a missed opportunity? I mean, they can always come back and print more Civil War cards, but do you have a thought on that kind of tension between such a valuable storyline? Um, actually, I'm all for them sort of um, pimping out the set for new players. Mm -hmm. I mean, our power creep in Versus is especially because I'm way more of a casual player, kind of is a turnoff at some points. Like, Dark Phoenix really hurts my desire to play because I don't like it when she hits the board. <laughs> Even when yeah. I play her, I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, she makes the game less fun. Yeah. Like, so, the nature of her power says, here's a list of fun things. I'm going to make one of them go away forever in this game. And that is not a good feeling. Yeah, so... When something brings them back to basics and they couple it with um, a desire to capture new players, give me that all day. The, sure. Because that means these cards aren't... They're still going to be on par because as we've seen, Goliath is a solid character. But they're not going to be Dark Phoenix. <laughs> I can't. Well, I mean, arguably, I don't think... There's very few people who want cards like Dark Phoenix in the game. Yeah. Like, I, I don't think Dark Phoenix is a card that necessarily appeals to experienced players at this point. When she first came out, I did not think she was going to be this bad. I was wrong. <laughs> uh, I remember playing against her and just not believing that any of her powers worked. <laughs> and people were like, oh, it's, uh, and, and you do this. I'm like, no, no. Seriously, what? Just stop using this ability for the rest of the game? Not even until she, like, dies or anything? <laughs> I think if they just reversed her stats, so she was a 15-10, that that would solve a significant percentage of my problem with her. Because not only does she come down and break the game and make the game less fun and slower, if the other person is also playing the game's only 9-drop, you can't stun each other, so you can end up in a total stalemate, which I realize is a critique that doesn't affect in-person events, but we haven't had any in-person events in a long time, and we have had Dark Phoenix games that, I mean, we had one game, I think it was in Quarantine Cup 2, where both players just drew out their decks, and like it was a complete stalemate that nobody ever cracked it. Uh, I don't remember how it got resolved. I think one player eventually conceded, but like that is... That is not a thing that we want to have in our yeah. game. Yeah. So I, I don't think Dark Phoenix should be the card against which we, we say, okay, well, is a card competitive? How does it compare to Dark Phoenix? No, 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 no. Yeah. Now, a card like, I think Wyatt Wingfoot is a much better example of a card that does like a fun, interesting thing that is not new player friendly at all. Yeah, well, no, I was, I was just saying the power creep. At some point, you have to bring things mm -hmm. back and sort of center yourself. Otherwise, I feel sure. like the power creep just keeps going until you get to something like Dark Phoenix. I think, because even in Magic, they uh, the core sets are sort of sets where they just kind of pull back to zero. Mm -hmm. They sort of ground themselves again. And um, with this Infinity format, uh, it makes, Versus has a hard time doing that, unless yeah. they put out whole arcs that are designed to be kind of the new base set or whatever, which and, they wouldn't call it that, but yeah. But, and I think this is a great set to do it because a lot of people love civil war. So, yeah. I mean, will it take away from some of the flavor? Maybe. Am I okay with that? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Sure. Do you think that, uh, we should expect them to do this kind of, back to basics type of expansion every summer, every other summer. Oh, uh, if they do it again, I would assume that we should at least get it every other summer. Cause I it kind of feels like it yeah. just given the track record. Yeah. You know, MCU came out over the summer leading into Gen Con. 
Yeah. So did Utopia Battles. Yeah, and Utopia Battles is actually another good one that felt very new player friendly too. The base box, not yep. not oh, the whole yes. arc, yeah, but the, the base, base box. box, yes. Yeah. So. But yeah, no, I I will say out of the two, going back to what we're talking about, out of the two cards, I like yours more because I'm definitely big into the flavor of the card. I think it really represents something. It's like the whole reason I like Deathlock. <laughs> oh, sure. I mean, that that's a card that is so well-designed flavor-wise that its functionality actually got held back a little bit. Yeah, I wanted it. It didn't it. end up being good enough because it was so spot-on flavor-wise. Yeah, I tried so hard to make that card. I think I ran it in, like, the first 10 decks I ever used. <sighs> I even tried some combos with the Inhumans because you put the card underneath your deck and then there's that card that lets you draw back. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, I can range hit someone, get this card underneath my deck, and then I can get it back with him. And it's like getting characters for free, sort of. But the sort combo of. is just so power hungry. <laughs> I mean, I think Kid Kaiju is another example where I, I love the flavor Oh, yeah, he's so good. But he's so frustrating to actually play because yeah. it, if <laughs> if the one change they made is that the, his power triggered at the start of your turn or during your main phase, or not at the start of your turn, at the end of your turn or during your main phase, but to have to have the necessary board conditions survive your opponent's turn to be able to trigger him is so, like, it's just too much. And maybe they had to do that to make sure that this guy didn't just come out and dominate everything. But yeah. it, one of the things about card games that I find so interesting is you generally can't make small changes. So another game I play a lot of, Destiny, when they, not Star Wars Destiny, Bungie Destiny, yeah. uh, when they make an adjustment to a gun, they can turn a gun's damage up by 2% or down by 5% or, or adjust its range by basically any conceivable percentage. Whereas in card games, these numbers are whole numbers, and with the exception of in-betweener, you can't go into fractions, and you have to... And the difference between three and four is gigantic, depending upon the situation. The difference between a one cost and a two cost, it's not that two costs cost one more, it costs twice as much. So... Yeah. Making these tiny adjustments on cards takes a card from being so overpowered that it'll dominate the meta to being completely unplayable. And you can do that just by adjusting one number on a card, which is why I think card games are so fascinating, why the design philosophy behind them. I spend a lot of time talking about the thought process behind cards, and I don't think everybody finds that as interesting as I do. But Oh, I do. I, I, do. I mean... I run a podcast where I talk by myself about this stuff. So clearly I have, I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it, you're absolutely hundred percent correct. Like in, um, with the Goliath that they gave us, if they had made him a five, three with the same power, just think about how much that changes it. Cause then he yeah, has, he's... he's a nine, seven. <laughs> And getting that extra nine means that he can now go into seven drops for the most part. Mm-hmm. I mean, it 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 would bump him up a whole nother break point. Yeah. Like a, a two supersized version of Goliath would be swinging three slots up the curve consistently, and a three power up version could probably hit a lot of the eight drops. Yeah, and and speaking of that, on your version of Goliath, if we had put it up to like a five. Uh, sort of like a Scarlet Witch, a 1-5. That means his power would never see the time of day until, like, turn 4. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he would be out there for... Which, he would be a good, a better blocker in that case, but that's kind of not why you played that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I, I, I mean, I'm disappointed that... I, I, you know, I got knocked out of, of the competition here. I felt like I, I picked a fair character that was important enough to the story that it wasn't like picking a background guy, but I, I didn't really think they were going to give us one. And then, you know, they did. And if it, you know, for the people who Goliath is like their guy, 
like their favorite character, and they aren't a fan of this moment in Civil War, they're a fan of Goliath. This is a much better card than the one I designed. Yes. Because I am not a Goliath fan first. I'm a Civil War fan first. So I I almost think of him as like a, a prop in the story. And that maybe doesn't do justice to this character if this is a guy that you're a really big fan of. And, you know... I think the char- the people that are big fans of this character deserve to have a fun version of him to play more than I deserve to have a person a version of him to uh, KO simply to trigger an effect because of that one moment in a comic book 15 years ago. So, I That's think true. I think I have talked myself into preferring Danny and Ben's version in general. I hadn't initially thought about it from the perspective of somebody who this is their favorite character. But if that's the case, I'd rather have somebody. I think that player's needs and desires are more important than mine here, even though I like my card better for me. I think this one is probably a better card to to have in the set because it's going to probably going to appeal to somebody out there a heck of a lot more than the one we threw together. Although I guess if that's the case, then you probably hate this card art. Because you see Goliath there looking all tough and strong, and you know what's coming. Yeah. In fact, two <laughs> two panels later. <laughs> yeah. Immediately. Uh, <laughs> man. But all right. Um, I guess that should about wrap us all up. Thank you again for, for joining us on today's Jank Take. Sorry you're out of the competition, um, but it was fun. Yeah, man. This was a good time. I'm glad you did it. Uh, maybe uh, maybe this uh, type of Nightcrawler composition should be something you do on on other future expansions as well. I mean, it w- I don't think it would work as good with a small box. Yeah. But uh, I, you know, for these battles boxes, it's pretty fun. I was thinking about it because I realized doing spoiler reactions. Uh, one, that market is horribly saturated. <laughs> there's like oh, that's not people, true. There's like ten people doing spoiler there's... reactions. And there's still not enough versus content to keep me satisfied. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I thought this would be something different, and it still like keeps the spoiler uh, real, the spoiler stuff real. Yeah, yeah, man, it was a lot of fun. I'm glad you uh, glad you reached out to me, and uh, I think it was a cool idea. This this whole process has been really entertaining. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe I'll see you back in a future competition. You have yeah, I. <laughs> I'll try to maintain my uh, losing immediately streak that I've got going here. (laughs) Definitely. All right, man. Talk to you later. See you guys all next time on the Jank Take.